Welcome to Popcorn History with the Freeborn County Historical Museum, Library and Village, and Stephanie Kibler and Risha Lilienthal. We have so many fun and interesting things here at the museum and happening at the museum. Every conversation we have, whether it be around a collection item, an exhibit, or a historic figure, has us popping out ideas. We refer to these as popcorn moments, hence popcorn history. For our first podcast, we selected favorite things as the topic. With more than 20,000 items in our collection, you can imagine how difficult it is to pick a favorite. The item that makes me smile every time I pass it is a small toy telephone fashioned after a 1921 cable telephone with rotary dial. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind where you put the receiver up to your ear. Risha, what's your favorite item? So my favorite item is the prosthetic hand that we got. We just got it in in 2020. So it's a new item to our collection. It belonged to Charlie Richter of Conger, who um, at the time was a farmer. He was blowing up rocks in a field in the early 1900s. The method in those days of getting rid of rocks in a field was to drill a hole in the rock, put in blasting powder or gunpowder, and then pack it with powdered brick, put a fuse on it, and light it to blow up the rock. So how it connects to my family history is that this is how my grandfather died. He actually, my paternal grandfather, when my father was four, he was blowing up rocks in a field, and an issue happened to where a rock didn't blow up. So he went and tried to check on it, and the the rock ended up blowing up near him, and it actually suffocated him. So that's really sad. Sorry to start us off on a sad note, but um, Charlie Richter was blowing up rocks in a similar way here in Conger, and he lost his left hand when he was shifting around the cigar box that they used for powder. So somehow he must have accidentally mixed in shotgun primers and the charge went off and he lost his left hand. And so that's why he has a prosthetic hand. So really he kind of created a little box of dynamite. Right, yeah. Um, And as I was processing this, my brain did a popcorn moment (laughs) and I went to J.J., Evans, Jimmy Walker, of Good Times, saying, Dynamite. Oh, my gosh. And it all belongs to Kid Dynamite. 1974. I did a big old leap and started reminiscing on that, which then caught me thinking about um, Happy Days, which also started in 1974. Um, and Marion Ross, who we have some stuff on exhibit from Marion Ross. We have a great Marion Ross exhibit, um, which then took me to Eddie Cochran. Oh, sure. Another star power there. Another star uh-huh. power. Popped again over to Summertime Blues, mm-hmm. which led me to Fountain Lake and the Ruble Sawmill. Oh, interesting. Which in 1855. Um, uh, was when George Rubel did the sawmill. Mm-hmm. Um, was the only water privilege in Albert Lee. Was destroyed by fire in 1869. 1861, I'm sorry. Um, and Rubel also um, built his home near the proposed dam and mill site. And I don't know if anybody knows this or how many people know this, ended up being involved in a court case in 1883 Whoa. that even today is controversial with oh. some Albert Leans. Apparently, Mr. Rubel gave a plot of land when um, the county seat became Albert Lee, and that was part of the bargaining tool that these three men did. Each gave a block of land. Well, Mr. Rubel wanted his back. Oh, Uh no. And ended up in court with a number of gentlemen testifying against him. And needless to say, the courthouse is still on Court Square. I I have a question, actually... I'm kind of surprised that I know this. Um, wasn't the county seat of of Freeborn County? Wasn't that like a competition between Albert Lee and Glenville, and and it wasn't it decided by a horse race? Am I remembering that correctly? Oh, well, actually, that, that is um, not been proven. Really, and there's nothing that we've found in the history books that show that. Um, the the race for the county seat was actually between St. Nicholas. 
the, the township of St. Nicholas. Right. Yep. And Albert Lee. Yep. And when Albert Lee won the county seat, St. Nicholas kind of disappeared. I was going to say, I've never heard of that township before. Right. They picked up the yeah. buildings and moved them out of town. Where where was St. Nicholas originally, do you know? Oh, dear. I In Freeborn County? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We have a cabinet that's a was made by a wandering cabinet maker from a farm on St. Nicholas. Huh. Yeah. Speaking of racing horses, did you know there's a race horse called Oh Happy Days? Happy Days. Right. Mr. Cunningham on Happy Days owned a hardware store. And uh, Charlie Richter... This man who we have his prosthetic hand, he attended business college in Albert Lee and specifically decided to go into hardware after he um, lost his hand because he couldn't really farm easily with that. And so he started his own hardware store in Conger, which is now Richter Hardware and Plumbing. And I believe it's still there. It's on the Conger website. I haven't been there personally, but it could very well be there. Uh Minnie Sherb was married to Charlie Richter in 1914, and she would ask him to wear a white glove on his prosthetic hand when they went to church. Now, we have white gloves in our military exhibit in Vietnam. Our Navy Captain Gerhard Erling Scar was born in Albert Lee on January 29th, 1943, and his uniform is on display with that lovely pair of white gloves in his dress uniform. Now, he graduated from Albert Lee High School in 1961 and joined the Navy in 1966. His military career was it was pretty extensive. Uh, so here's a couple of highlights, in my opinion. Uh, he flew over 500 combat missions in a helicopter gunship. And I don't know what a helicopter gunship looks like, but that sounds kind of cool to me. Uh, he also made two deployments in Antarctica in support of the National Science Foundation. And in recognition of this help, the National Science Foundation named a prominent geographical feature in the Queen Alexandria range of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, the Scar Ridge, after him. So Albert Lee has some connections to Antarctica. Um, but he served in the Vietnam War, and the Vietnam War was also called the Living Room War because uh, the access and ability to broadcast footage of war ha was never before seen. And this kind of brought me to uh, things I didn't know about and have been learning here at the museum in Freeborn County. I didn't realize that in the 60s, there wasn't really a remote control for the television. <laughs> this is something Stephanie shared with me when we were talking about it. Uh, and, and I believe she said, how did you change the channel? <laughs> You mean you had to get up off of your what? butt and physically go and turn a dial? Right. People did that? They didn't just, like, wire something from the TV, like a wire across a living room to your couch? Oh, my gosh. Well, and see, that was the first remote in invented in 1950 did have... Uh, connected to the TV. It was oh, wow. still connected to the TV by wire. I was kind of being facetious. No, That's but that awesome. was actually a thing. <laughs> yeah. But then you also, we also had the conversation on rabbit ears. Right. The, the rabbit antennae. ear antenna. Yeah. Which now, that also is a wireless thing. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And uh, so technically there was a remote before the 1960s and the first wireless one was in 1955. It was called the Flashmatic by Eugene Polly or Polly, I'm not sure how you say it, uh, but they didn't really become widespread until the 1980s. So, yeah, our 1960s into early 70s living room would not have a remote. Uh, but this also reminded me of how I didn't know about some telephone technology that we have been talking about called Party Line. And uh, so we have a telephone office in our museum village. Uh, when I first came aboard here around October of 2019, one of the first things I was doing was looking through our tour guide book to kind of familiarize myself with it. And I had a definite um, deer in the headlights moment when I read a section that said party lines of eight or more. And it said a different ring for each residence on the party line. Like, for example, two shorts and one long 
On the crank phone, one long was a full circle and short was a partial circle. And I'm sitting here thinking, why are there circles on the telephone? And how do you know when you're supposed to stop for like partials and longs? And what is this crank? I was I was really confused. And this is where she looked at me in a shocked <laughs> manner. And I said, oh, I remember party lines. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and she said, what? <laughs> and I'm not that old. so No, and like telephone offices and switchboards in Albert Lee didn't end until 1978. Oh, wow. So, yeah, they were there for quite a while. And one of the earliest forms of the telephone is the little toy candlestick phone that we have example well the candlestick phone was one of the original forms and we have the toy one in our toys and dolls uh exhibit it has a little note on it that says call kitty k-i-d-d-i-e on it which i thought was really cute i wonder on on a on the um switchboards how many did businesses share a party line oh maybe you know I, i mean like i know some businesses had their own um switchboards in their buildings within their offices so do you think though how how did calls go through to a business i wonder well now i'm only thinking about like the switchboard operators with the like pulling out and putting in right that's all i know that's as far as i can go with that (laughs) information yeah are you implying that there would maybe be like a switchboard like there would be somebody dedicated at whichever business that their job is to be like that's what i'm wondering the telephone operator for this business right right yeah oh you want to reach this person in this office let me just patch you right through oh my gosh yeah would that be Something wow. like that, because I mean, if you have a good in Albert Lee back in the in the eighteen hundreds or in the yeah eighteen hundreds had um, or early nineteen hundreds, sorry, had a number of large businesses, sure. so they must have had multiple phone lines going in. Um, American Gas Company would mm-hmm. be one of those. Wilson and Company would be another. The Woolworth store, oh they must have had multiple phones. You would think, yeah. Um, that's interesting. I, don't I know wonder how they would have organized that. And yeah. I wonder if they did then have a variety of phones when all of these businesses staged their strike in 1937. How did they handle those phone calls? Because the, oh. Albert Lee was um, touted as being, and I'll quote here by the unionist, one of the most vicious and well organized anti labor towns in Minnesota. Really? So, and, and those strikes got violent. So, how do you think if you're on a switchboard or a telephone, you handle the calls that are oh coming in? Gosh. There must have been calls to action. There must have been anger. Right. Um, what are you guys doing in there? <laughs> right? Right? Uh, one of my favorite, um, I shouldn't say, well, yeah, it's a favorite piece of history, I guess, from um, the 1937 strike because it was multiple groups that went on strike and the Woolworths clerks did a sit down they were called the sit downers and they actually there was a theme song so when the American gas guys would march from one plant to the next with drums and flutes and horns and whatever else the Woolworths sit downers would sing a song to the tune of the old gray mare um, and one of the lines that they had in there was the five and dime. She ain't what she used to be. Oh, <laughs> I thought that was really kind of wow. a fun. That's and they great. sang it right to the American Gas Company strikers, which I think is really kind of a fun yeah. um, little him. story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about horse racing, too. Yeah. Um, there were horse races back in the day in Freeborn County. Um, and. The, the old gray mare kind of made me think of the um, George Rubel was one who had had a horse. Uh, at the time, a great big, nice chestnut Kentucky thoroughbred mare named Sleepy Kate. Oh, she was one of the largest thoroughbreds um, that had ever been seen in the area. Um, handsome as a picture. Hmm. Oh, neat. There's a, Which, there's a lot of Kates we have in our history of freeborn here we do yeah and it that that kind of made me think again about um going back to happy days remember all the oh. pictures they'd have on their on their end tables you know we say the end tables with all the photos oh well, sure yeah 
Same thing with good times. They always had the <laughs> photos of the families. They took yeah. place in the living room, right? which I, you can see that transition from um, the time families spent in the living room, and all of a sudden then the Vietnam War living room comes into play. <gasps> Wow. And how that dynamic must have changed from that 1950s to the 1960s and how you're interacting in your family space. Oh, that's cool. (laughs) 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 Yeah. (laughs) Mind blown. All right. Well, I've left Risha speechless. So here, Risha, here's some popcorn. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you.